Welcome to Paris, known as the City of Lights, thanks to the invention of electricity. In the dawn of the 20th century, electricity was a tremendous revolution. It changed the way people worked, the way people communicated, the way people were entertained. It even changed the urban landscape, allowing us to build at greater heights. This revolution took 50 years to happen. And right now, another revolution is underway the Internet Revolution. Less than 20 years ago, the Internet started changing our lives. Today there are... It started changing the way we work. Changing the way we communicate. changing the way we are entertained. It even changed our social landscape, making our world flatter. Internet has changed everything, and the best is to come. We know it's big. And yet, do we know its impact on the economy? Do we know its contribution to growth and wealth? Do we know how it benefits consumers, companies and governments? Do we know how countries are capturing value from it? Actually, no, not much of this data was available until today. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Mathieu Pellissier du Rosas, and I'm a senior partner at McKinsey and Company in France. I was born on year one of the internet, the year the ARPANET started to operate. I got my first computer when I was 13 years old. I was extremely proud, and at that time, 48K sounded like a huge memory. It was connected, but just to my tape recorder, nothing more. And I have to confess, I was not that good at coding. So that's why I gave up. And that's how I ended up at McKinsey & Company. My name is James Manika. I'm a senior partner in our Silicon Valley office, and I also lead our McKinsey Global Institute. Like Matthew, I grew up with the internet. I grew up with the internet on three continents. And I've had the privilege for the last 17 years of working at the heart of uh, Silicon Valley with many of the companies that have been at the forefront of the internet revolution and seeing how it all has happened over the last uh, few decades. I think we've all experienced the, the way in which the internet has actually changed the way we experience our daily lives and the way our businesses and other organizations operate. But I think there's always been a lingering question and the question's always been exactly how much impact has the internet had on economic growth and prosperity and wealth? That has been a question that's been around for some time. And I think most of the uh, work that had been done on that question has been somewhat inconclusive. And that's, that is what has motivated the research uh, that we've undertaken for the last while. We've had the great benefit of uh, building on work that many economists and other thought leaders have done. And we're, I'd like to acknowledge two in particular. Christian Sanetian and Martin Bailey were incredibly helpful to us uh, in this extensive effort over the last few years. And so Matthew is going to start with the highlights. So what did we find out? Well, first, we are now able to answer the question, how big is the internet economy? Some of you refer to the internet as a land, when in fact, if internet were a country, it would be bigger than Spain, and it would grow faster than Brazil. Internet today in our economy as a larger share than sectors such as energy or even agriculture. So it has become a considerable sector for all of us. How would it get there? Well, we studied in detail 13 countries. The eight G8 countries, of course, plus China, Brazil, India and we added up two web-intensive countries, 
South Korea, and Sweden. Taken all together, those 13 countries represent 70% of the global GDP. And on those 13 countries, the size of internet is 3.4% of the GDP. So the number is huge, but it's only part of the story. The real question is, where is this internet activity? So let's look at that in detail. The first part is private consumption. Private consumption is what you and I do when we shop online, when we play online, when we buy services. And that's about half of the story. What company, companies do in search for productivity, in search for innovation, when they invest into the internet, is about a third of the story. And the rest is what government are doing. So we can see that the internet today is reaching all actors of the economy. But even more surprising, we did a fairly detailed survey on close to 5,000 small and medium enterprise. And what we found out is that the value of internet is created for three quarters by companies that do not, do not define themselves as internet pure plays. So the internet is reaching far beyond its initial boundaries. Well, I think it's clear that the internet is big, but perhaps more importantly, we find that the internet is still growing, and also more importantly, deepening how, how, it, how it affects companies and organizations around the world. If you take a look at the mature economies, the ones that uh, Matthew mentioned that we looked at, and if you go back all the way to, to, to 1986, uh, the internet has accounted for close to 10% of GDP growth in the mature economies starting back in 1986. In fact, if you look at the last five years alone for which we have complete data, it's contributed 21% uh, of the GDP growth that's occurred in these countries, which is a doubling of its contribution uh, to growth, which is actually quite, quite, quite striking. Now, it's more important also to keep in mind that this is not a jobless growth story. Uh, and in fact, as you know, one of the questions that's often debated is, how much does the internet contribute to jobs? Well, in the work that we've done, first we looked at France in particular, but also looked at the survey of businesses we looked at across the 12 countries. One of the things that we found is that for every job that's been lost uh, through the efficiencies and gains that come from the internet, we've gained 2.6 net new jobs. So this is quite a substantial uh, contribution to job creation uh, that comes from, from the internet. But you know, James, this is only part of the story. Something quite striking that we found is that the internet maturity is actually correlating with an increase in standard of living. So this sounds a bit complicated. So what do we mean by that? Well, standard of living is fairly classical. We measure it by GDP per capita and GDP per capita growth. Internet maturity, what do we mean? Well, for every country, we've taken a bunch of indicators about the activity of that country on the internet, its infrastructure, its e-commerce, its expenditure on the net. And what we find is that there is a close correlation between internet maturity and raising standard of living. What does that mean? Well, we referred earlier to revolutions. In fact, what our correlation is showing is that if you look at what the industrial revolution achieved in 50 years, the internet economy can do it in 15 years. This is a proof of the fantastic acceleration provided by the internet. Some of these macroeconomic facts that we've been citing don't even tell the full story. Uh, we can look at how the internet has actually affected us as consumers and businesses. If you think about consumers, for example, we now experience a wealth of services, uh, uh, ways of participating and engaging in the world such as we'd never imagined before. And in fact, if we think about many of these free services, many of them are actually paid for through these uh, various different advertising-based business models. But when we've actually asked, and you look at research that we've done and others have done as to how much do consumers actually value these services, 
depending on which country you're looking at, consumers value these services anywhere from $18 a month if they were going to pay for them, all the way up to $28 a month, depending again on which country you're talking about. That's a tremendous amount of uh, consumer benefit and consumer surplus that consumers are capturing today. You can also t turn and look at businesses. Now, in this room, all of you know how, how the internet has transformed your businesses, how you engage customers and you compete and you innovate. But the impact goes far beyond this room. In fact, when we've looked at many, many, many businesses, such as the ones that Matthew was talking about, if you look at businesses that, are, that make a lot of use of the internet, meaning they, they uh, spend a lot on in internet infrastructure, and they also drive a lot of usage of the internet, they tend to grow at twice the rate that businesses that don't tend to grow. So it has a big impact on, on growth. In fact, you can even look at other factors like exports, for example. In fact, we found that many companies that actually use the internet intensively tend to export at twice the rate that others that don't use the internet tend to export. Uh, you could also bring it all the way down to the bottom line, profitability. And in fact, when we look at profitability across the board for many of the organizations, uh, across the entire value system and the value chain, the internet has contributed as much as 10% to profitability. And that's come from companies becoming a lot more efficient, but also some of it has come from the top line revenue growth uh, that has come from using the internet. So this is quite substantial uh, impact from the internet. So now, thanks to you, James, we know. We know the internet economy is not just big. It is really, really big in economic terms. We know it's creating growth. We know it's generating net jobs. We know it does correlate with an increase in standard of living. But do we know who is framing the internet? Do we know where to find the best ecosystems? Do we know who is capturing value out of the internet? To answer those very complicated, and I have to say highly debated questions, we've created an index to try to measure the strengths of ecosystems. And we used four dimensions. Size, of course, performance, growth, and preparation of the future. Now, let's look at the results of this because the results actually surprised us. Let's talk about size first. Well, of course, the US ecosystem is the largest ecosystem in the internet. Its strengths is that it is spanning all across the value chain. It is then followed by Japan, with an ecosystem twice as smaller, and then followed by China, again, twice as smaller as Japan. So that's it for size. Let's talk now about performance. What do we find on performance? Well, the first ecosystem on performance is actually the UK. By performance, we mean the ability to capture value and to make profit. The number two ecosystem is Sweden. Why is that? Well, actually, two reasons. One, those two countries are leveraging their huge usage base. Second, it's a reflection of the weight, size, and performance of their telecom operators. Actually, telco, telecom operators are the locomotives and the G-wells of the European internet. So that's it for performance. Let's talk about growth now. Who is really growing in the internet? Well, India, China, Brazil are the three countries growing the faster. Let's talk about preparation of the future now. What do we mean by this? It's a complicated concept. Well, in fact, we looked at various indicators like patent, number of researchers, numbers of scientific publications, R&D spending, both in absolute value and in relative terms. And what do we find here? Again, Sweden is at the top in terms of preparation of the future, followed by Japan and then by the US. So net-net, when you take all this and try to look at where is the aggregated best ecosystem, we've got a quite interesting classification that you can see on the screen. And what we get out of it is that actually the game is probably far more open than what we first imagined. Every ecosystem has its strengths. The US has their initial size. The U Europe has its telco operators. India, China, Brazil, South Korea, 
of their impressive dynamism. Actually, in the land of internet, every nation can claim a stake in capturing value. One more thing about indicators. There is one big lesson we learn out of the 20th century, and you know it. It's only what gets measured that gets done. We believe the internet community should measure and monitor its progress on a more regular basis. From our research, we came up with four indicators. Two are on the consumption side, two are on the supply side. Two are measuring input, two are measuring output. While we know those indicators are imperfect, we know they can be improved. And in line with the internet open source mode, you know, we put, we put all our methodologies, all our data, all our algorithm, and we invite everybody to give us suggestions for improvement, constructive criticism. We will publish every year the debate those indicators will sparkle, and probably also those numbers. And we hope to do that at the next edition of the G8 Forum. So now we know that the internet is big. We know that it matters in a, in a, in real, in a real economic sense. And we also know that it's become an important driver of economic growth, uh, wealth, and prosperity. And we now have metrics. Uh, so what? What do we do now? Uh, we actually think that there are some important implications that come out of uh, some of this work. I think from, from the business standpoint, I don't need to tell this group how to think about the internet. You already do it. Uh, you're competing on it. So, and I'm sure we're going to have lots more discussions in the next few days about that. But I wanted just to highlight a couple of ideas from a public sector and a public policy standpoint, as well as the kinds of things that uh, this group and the G8 uh, can do and work on together. First, from a public policy standpoint, two, two small ideas. One is that I think we all, policymakers ought to be encouraged to actually invest in how the government and governments around the world actually use the internet themselves. It's quite striking when you think about the rates of adoption and how much governments use or don't use the internet uh, in comparison to what the private sector does. And in, any, in every study that we've done and others have done, the enormous productivity benefit to the public sector of using the internet is actually enormous. The second idea is that uh, we think governments can also play a very important role in making sure the uh, uh, they don't do any harm, as somebody pointed out earlier today. And I think that takes several forms. I think part of that is making sure that they continue to drive some of the infrastructure investments that are quite fundamental for the continued flourishing of the internet. The other idea is to make sure that, in fact, they are investing the human capital uh, that is necessary, as well as the capital, and fun and capital formation and financing that's crucial for the internet. And we also think it's, it's, it's also of fundamental importance that governments create the right environment that allow the internet to continue to flourish. Uh, and and, and that, is, that includes making sure that it remains open, uh, giving policies that encourage usage and adoption, and making sure that uh, we don't do any harm, as again, somebody pointed out. And I think in terms of what this group can do in dialogue with the, with the, uh, with the, with the public policy, is there are lots of uh, issues that are quite contentious that are worthy of discussion. How we think about uh, managing identities on the internet, how we think about privacy, how we think about intellectual property, and how we think about, uh, again, open access of the internet. These are very important questions that I think this group with policymakers ought to be engaging and discussing about. And I'm glad to say that it's, about, uh, that it's actually happening here. That's why you're all here, so we're excited about that. So I think in conclusion, our view is that the internet obviously matters, and we hope that the facts and ideas that we've shared with you are going to be helpful for your conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.